Welcome back to the garage. If this is your first time visiting my channel, please go ahead, click on subscribe and also click on that bell to receive all the updates and activities on my channel. All right, so it's been about two months since uh, my latest video, or my last video. Uh, no, I haven't died. I'm still on the planet. And uh, it's, what's today? Today is March 12th. Um, yeah, it's a little bit over two months since I posted the last video. And we're just about at the end of the season. It's been kind of up and down in the Northeast, and uh, we kind of got to a late start. We had about six or seven good weeks uh, of riding. And right now it's about 60 degrees, and pretty much any snow that we had in Massachusetts is pretty much gone. It's pretty much all brown. And even in northern New Hampshire is, uh, is uh, starting to suffer the effects. But... So anyway, uh, the latest project, uh, well, in the garage, this is this guy right here. This is actually Cameron's sled. Uh, this is the, the sled that everybody loves to hate. This is a fusion. Um, but again, this isn't a bad fusion. I guess this is the good fusion if you, if you want to, you know, kind of qualify as that. This is a 600. You know, the, uh, the ones that had all the issues were the 900. And to some effect, the 700. But this sled is pretty much rock solid. It has the tried and true Liberty 600 carb with uh, exhaust valves on it. Really no issues on it. But um, what we had with this sled uh, when we were uh, riding up in uh, New Hampshire for our February vacation. We were up there for a week. Uh, this sled started developing a, uh, a gas leak. And um, we didn't want to deal with it up there and because we really didn't have any uh, tools and working on this fusion as far as the air box is kind of a pain in the butt right so we opted just to kind of deal with it throughout the week and now that uh that trip is done we're back here and we're good we're gonna do some uh maintenance on it but so let me tell you a little bit about this fusion again this is no six um it's got the simmons wide skis on it it's got scratchers up on the a arms um it's, it's also been stretched to a 136 it has the uh what is this i believe it's a 1.6 ice ripper on it and the uh the rails are the ice age extent they're actually uh full rails from ice age they're not the extension kits the skid was taken apart and and and, and uh, new rails are put in and uh extended out so it's also got the uh, the big wheel kit in the back. So the two, there's two wheels on the inside. The ones on the outside have been deleted. And uh, so yeah, this is a nice little sled. It's got some updates on it. So another thing that was done is if you've ever owned a Fusion, you will notice that sometimes they will run hot. And it's because of the location of the cooler. So what was done on this sled when it was extended out uh, the 10 inches or whatever for the uh, the uh, the 136 the um, the heat exchanger was actually slid back to uh, uh, aid in cooling we'll talk about that when we actually take it apart but what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna take the carbs off and figure out where this leak is coming from All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the uh, the carbs off, figure out where the fuel leak is on the sled and go from there, right? So one would say, oh, yeah, you can take the carbs off, whatever, and be done within 15 minutes. Not so on, a, on an IQ sled, especially the car ones. Um, this air box will give you fits. It is an absolute nightmare to try to get this thing back in and situated and the, and the reason is because of the the, the height of this thing uh, believe it or not that that air box is is about 18 inches in in height it actually goes all the way down to the tunnel right so what happens is with everything being uh jammed in there um and you're dealing with so much surface area it's very difficult to get it lined up and what it is there's a bracket that exists behind the air box uh, in front of the tank that that air box needs to slide into and, and unless you actually have leverage from the back side pulling it in it's almost impossible to get in it can be done but if you're out in the middle of the snow in the woods yeah you're screwed right 
So what we're gonna do is, we're actually gonna, to make this a little bit easier, we're gonna take the seat off, the console, the tank, and take all that stuff off, and you know, take the carbs off, clean them, and everything else. So it's a little bit extra work to get, you know, to do that, but in the long run, it's worth it, because taking the 10 or 15 minutes to basically take all that stuff out, it's gonna save you like an hour, or an hour and a half of swearing, cussing and basically losing your mind trying to get that air box in so with that being said let's get started let's get to work all right so we've popped the seat off and the seat is pretty basic it's just like any other sled there's two bolts that come through the tunnel and basically they screw into it on these they're, they're, they're three eighths so this is a better explanation as far as what was what was done to the cooler as far as it being moved back the cooler just riveted onto the tunnel. We drilled out, we drilled out the rivets and we slid it back and then we uh, um, put this other piece in there to uh, kind of strengthen up the tunnel. So what we want to do now is we want to remove the console so we can get the tank out. And on these IQs, it's, it's not that hard to do. Uh, there's just a couple of things holding the console down. One is the big neck, well, the big nut on the filler neck. That's pretty standard. We got to uh, pop the choke out. We got to um, take the rope off the recoil handle. Got to unplug the ignition. And then we got to take uh, these two Torx bits off the uh, the console because it's actually split. It's designed to actually uh, go around the steering post to make it easier. And from, the, from what I can remember, that should be it. All right, so we have the console off. Like I said, we just removed the nut off the neck, pop that off. Pop the uh, the choke off, remove the, uh, the handle from the recoil. We just put a tie it like a little clove hitch so it doesn't fall through. And then what do we do? We unplug the ignition, which is right there. The key switch was left attached to the, uh, the console. And then we just remove the two bolts, remove the handle. Uh, the handlebar pad cover, and then we just kind of rotate it out and around. All right, so at this point, next thing we want to do is we're going to remove the tank, and the tank is held onto the tunnel by two 7 16 bolts. And then there's the vents for the tank. And then what we're going to do is we're going to separate the line coming from the, the fuel inlet on the tank from the, uh, from the shutoff. So we're just going to loosen up that clamp. Do all that, and then the tank will slide back. All right, so the tank has been removed. So here's the business end of the tank. You have a single electrical connection that's used for the uh, the uh, the float in there for the uh, gives you the indication of fuel level in the tank, and you have the main uh, supply line coming out of the tank. We just get disconnected like that, disconnected that like we said. So now we're looking at the back end of the air box. That's this big guy right here. You can, you can just tell this thing is huge. It's quite tall. And we're going to go ahead and pop it out. So one other upgrade this sled has, if you have a Fusion, particularly an 05 or an 06, uh, you probably have had complaints of cold hands. And the reason is, it's because of the voltage regulator that Polaris used. Uh, so at some point, they did offer an upgrade. And what it does, you take the uh, the new regulator from the kit and then you mount it on the chain guard and then there's a uh, a harness that plugs into the original voltage regulator that's on the other side of the uh, the tunnel and basically you leave that in place and then you attach the wiring harness as a daisy chain and bang 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 now you have you have warm hands right in case anybody was wondering what that is um so what we gotta do is we gotta take this air box out now that's the CDI. We're going to plug, unplug that, unplug the little strap that's holding it in, and then the little uh, two carb vents, they're out in front of the uh, air box. And then that's pretty much it. And then it should pretty much roll forward and we'll be able to get it out. So now that we have access to the carbs, let's take a look. I haven't touched anything. So like I said, this thing had a pretty good size uh, fuel leak coming out of it. And we were also getting awful gas mileage, as you would expect. Um, so what we're gonna do is kind of get you in there, right? 
So the first thing that you're gonna see is, uh, looks like we had a, uh, a stowaway in here at one point, because there's a mouse nest uh, down there. If you look, the, um, the water trap is bent to a, an extreme angle on the left-hand side, or the PTO one. And then the one on the mag side is, look, looks pretty good. But if you look right here, there's a lot of excess fuel and oil build up. This is actually pretty wet. I may not show it on video, but it is very wet. As compared to the one on the left-hand side or the PTO, that's pretty dry. So what I suspect is going on is we have a, uh, an overfueling condition. We have a leaking needle and seat on the mag side, and I'm not surprised at all. And I'll show you why once we get these cards pulled off. Why don't we talk about the flat slide carbs and how they work and difference of, to the Makunis, right? And we'll go over this a, a little bit more in detail uh, when they're on the bench. But you have um, the choke cable coming in, you have the throttle cable coming in, and these two cars are mechanically linked to each other. Uh, there's a common shaft on, on both of these assemblies that control both carbs uh, simultaneously. And then you have an idle adjustment screw, which is right there, which will um, correct the idle up and down on, on both carbs. So it's pretty simple to adjust. And then over here, right I'm pointing out the, with the, the, the harness of the three wires coming out, that's the throttle positioning sensor. Polaris used that to work in conjunction with the CDI to basically tell the CDI where the, the throttle was in conjunction uh, with the engine speed. So based on the throttle position sensor, uh, it will relay the information to the CDI and then the CDI will use different maps to advance the ignition and the timing based on where the throttle is, right? So that is pretty, pretty important to make sure that it's set correctly. Uh, I'll show you what I use to set that. But to get these things out, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the choke and the throttle. And then there's a couple uh, hose clamps that hold the carbs onto the boots. That's nothing out of the ordinary. But with these two uh, cables, the only thing you wanna do so you don't screw up you know, what your slide height is, either on the choke or the, uh, the throttle, uh, basically these two are the jam nuts uh, or the lock nuts on the top. All you want to do is just crack these free, and these are 10 millimeter on both sides. And then below it, there's another 10 millimeter corresponding nut. So you're going to loosen those on the top and then um, back the nut completely off on the cable and then pull the cables out. Um, don't, other than cracking these, don't move them because then you'll, you'll screw up the height. So the first one we're going to go after is the throttle cable, which is this one right here. You can see as as I uh, go up on the throttle, basically the, uh, the assembly comes up. They're both 10 millimeter. Put one up at the jam nut up the top, and then grab the bottom one. And that is free. So now this is loose, right? We're not gonna tight, we're not gonna mess with this jam nut at all, right? Because if you leave that where it is, when we put it back in, we're gonna have the correct uh, slide height and everything else. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna reach around and back that nut all the way down so it falls off. And then we're going to take the cable out. All we did was we picked the cable up, slid it out of the groove, and then we backed it out of the assembly. So now the throttle cable is out. And we're gonna do the same thing for the choke level, choke lever. Same thing, holding on to the jam nut. All right, so it's loose. Completely spun the nut down. And again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull up in the cable. Right, so it, it clears the bracket. 
pop that out. Then if you want, you can pick that nut out so it gets out of the way. And then we're going to rotate the cable out of the uh, assembly. Right, there you go. So about, now both cables are out. So now I'll go ahead and remove the TPS connector. The clip to release it is on the back hand side or the right hand side. You just press it, <clears throat> you press it, and then you pull up. Make sure you don't forget to do that before you remove the carbs or you will break the housing on the sensor and then you have to buy a new one. All we have to do is loosen up the clamps that'll hold the, the, the carbs on and then the, these will pop right out. Before you can take the carbs out, don't forget to disconnect the, uh, the lines for the oil injection. They're just held on by a couple clamps, loosen the clamps, and then just slide the hoses off. All right, so we have the carbs out, and I was just looking at the uh, everything, and I was looking at the wire trap line, and I believe pretty much found our leak. So, if you look, that thing is completely split open. All right, so again, that is a perfect example of when you put stuff together, pay attention to make sure nothing is being bound up or hung up or anything like that. Because if that was uh, put together correctly, that would never happen. But because it was at a 90 degree for so long, it just it eventually failed and split. All right, so we have the carbs off. So now this is a perfect uh, time to go ahead and inspect everything else. Take a look at your car boots, take a uh, look at the uh, the reeds, go in there if you have a boroscope, or if you want, you can take the car boots off and take the reeds off too, check for any uh, chip pedals. It's up to you how you want to do it, but again, take advantage of it now while, while everything's apart. Um, you know, go ahead and replace the lines for the oil injection. Again, it's one of those things, you might as well, because if you already have it apart, you might as well do it, especially with this machine, it's what, 15 years old? So take the time to do it now. There's no sense of, of doing this again, right? So another thing with the IQ uh, sleds, um, they actually use a, uh, a universal joint in with the steering. And that universal joint has a tendency to uh, stiffen up or seize up. So while you have everything apart, Go ahead and spray the uh, that down with some penetrating fluid. All right, so looking at the back side of the carbs, um, this is actually the side that's gonna be up against the engine. I'll show you a couple things to look out for. These are the two oiling ports for your oil injection. There's one there, there's one there. You don't typically have to do anything with those. Just uh, spray some uh, carb cleaner in, in there and make sure that they're clean. These are your two air adjustment or fuel adjustment screws. Um, so. What you wanna do is you wanna take these out and clean them up and set them back to where they were from factory spec. You typically wanna do this beforehand because once these are in the sled, they're almost impossible to reach. Um, but make sure you do take these out and, uh, and, and clean them. And then there's a little bit better explanation of all the, uh, the common linkage and everything else. I figured I would, I would want to show you that before we take before we start ripping these apart. All right, now let's get to it. All right, so at this point, we're going to start this assembly of the carb. The float poles are held on to the body by a 17 millimeter uh, hex, and then there's a uh, a screw in the the one o'clock position, right on both sides. So go ahead and remove those. Then go ahead and remove that screw. Be careful not to strip it because you do need these. And then just give the bowl a tap, kind of break the seal, and then pull it off. Okay, and then we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. All right, so now we have the, uh, the float bowl covers removed, and now we're looking at the, uh, the inside of it. All right, so basically you have your main jet, you have your pilot jet, which is right down here. And I forget what Makuni calls that, but that needs to come out too. And then you have your float bowl assembly right here, which is made out of plastic, right? 
So uh, these are standard six millimeter. Let's go ahead and take those out. We're gonna move the two plastic, I'm sorry, they move the two Philip screws that are holding the plastic float ball assembly down. And we're gonna take it all the way out and I'm gonna show you what the Achilles heel of these things are. And this is pretty much the only thing that ever goes wrong with these uh, flat slide carbs, uh, which is there's no ring inside there. So let's go ahead and uh, start taking everything apart. All right, so now we're going after the pilot. Having the right screwdriver on this one is so important. Don't guess. Um, this is the one I've always used. Uh, it works out great. So, so the biggest issue when you're taking the pilots out is having the right uh, screwdriver. And there's two things. Trying to find the, a screwdriver with the right diameter that can fit down that body and then the one with the correct with uh, on the uh, on the blade but once you get the right one and you have it it's very easy to get these pilots out now we're going to go after the float assemblies again these are just held on by phillips screws And if you're doing this, don't use power tools. You want to do it by hand because if you use a power tool, you'll strip it out and then you'll be in for a world of hurt. So we took that out and all we're going to do now is we're just going to pull the float ball assembly out. And if you look, that's the O-ring that fails on it. And we'll get more into that. All right, so we have all the pilots and the mains out. What we're going to do now is we're going to take out the air screws, right, on both sides. And before we do that, we're going to basically run, run them in all the way until it's lightly seated, just like you do normally, just like it was a, a round slide. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to count how many turns it is, and uh, we'll go from there. I believe spec on this, I want to say it's two and a half turns, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, but we're going to figure out what they were. Uh, what they're set at right now. All right, so here we go. So let's count. Half. One. And a half. We're going to call that one and three quarters, right? So now we're going to back it out all the way. All right, so that first one is done. So this is a PTO. Half, one, and a half, I'll call that one and three quarters too. All right, so both sides were one and three quarters. What we'll do is we'll see what factory was and then compare it to this. Um, I'm probably just going to return these back to what they were. Because uh, other than the fuel leaking issue, this sled always ran very, very well. Okay, so at this point, we have the bodies uh, pretty much taken apart. Why don't we go ahead and just do our normal thing where we soak everything, blow everything out, and then go ahead and start reassembly and go from there. All right, so at this point, I've gone through, I've cleaned the, uh, the, the, the car body, went through all the, the main jets, the pilot jets, the bowls and everything else and cleaned all that stuff. And typically all I do is I just use carb cleaner and compressed air. Just go and spray everything down, clean everything out, make sure, you know, everything's nice and clean. Um, one trick that you can use, um, say if uh, you have some stuff built up in the pilots, just take a piece of uh, speaker wire and strip it off and then you can use that to clean out the uh, little tiny holes in the pilot jets because usually they're pretty tiny and every once in a while they will build up some uh, some residue in there if you do use this uh this little speaker wire trick it pretty much will always clean it right out so at this point what you want to do we've uh we've taken the the float assemblies off and then we separated the needles and seats and if you're ever working on flat slides 
before you even pull them off, you have to go order these two O-rings. Um, if you don't, you're just going to be doing this again. Because uh, these little O-rings are what will cause uh, flooding out. They're, they're made out of the same material that's on the needles and seats. Uh, they made it, they're made out of Vitin. And what will happen is, as soon as you pull these out, um, they will never reseal again and they will leak. So go ahead and... and Go to your local Polaris dealer. Uh, the part number is 313-0533. They're like a buck a piece. And, you know, you have to do it. It's, it's not an option. You have to do it. All right, so all, all we're going to do at this point is we're just going to replace those O-rings and put the the, uh, the float assemblies back together and then just reassemble the car the same way we took it apart. You'll notice when you go to reassemble these with the no O-rings, you can actually feel it seal all the way down. It makes a nice positive seal so you know you're not going to have any leaks. Whereas if you just try to reuse the old O-rings, the assembly would just, would, essentially it would just fall right in and it would just go back and forth and you, you would know that you're going to have a leak. So... Again, there's no sense of doing this over again. If you're trying to save a buck or two, it makes no sense. So just go ahead and grab the parts that you need. And there's a saying, you do it once and you do it right. Um, those, there's no sense. Try and take shortcuts, especially with something like this. Because if you do, you are just going to be doing it over again. So, And that really goes for a lot of things in life. Um, even if you try to, you know, if you're working on anything. If you try to save a couple bucks on something, you know, take your pick. And typically what will happen is. What you tried to save a couple bucks on will fail. So say, uh, just for the sake of math, say something costs a hundred bucks and you try to do it right. What you try to go out the cheap way and you bought something that was 40 bucks and that thing fails, you know, your, your, your cheaper solution failed not only are you out the, your original 40 bucks, now you have to reinvest the 100 bucks to do it right the first time or do it right again. Whereas if you just spent the $100 to do it right in the first place, you'd be better off in the long run because you, you know, you're not chasing the same problem. So it's the way I've always kind of looked at things. Especially if you're doing the work on your own. There's no sense in trying to save money on parts. Because you save money on labor. So essentially if you're paying yourself to do work. Why wouldn't you want the best available part that you could put into whatever it may be that it is. So... That's why you do things on your own. You're trying to save money. But you have to pick and choose where you want to spend the money in the right place. You know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of a bonus that if you're doing things on your own, you then have the luxury to go out and buy good parts. Hope that makes sense. Does to me at least. But I know some people are on a budget. They can only do so much. And they try to get by quickly and cheaply. Sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes you're not. It will come back to bite you in the butt. And then the job will cost you twice as much as, it, as you anticipated.
All right, so we got the mains in, we got the pilots in, we got whatever these things that are, whatever they call, those are in. The float assemblies are in. Um, so at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to put the bowls back in. And maybe hard to see, but if we look at the bowl, there's a that's where the screw hole is. And then there's a little dowel. And essentially, those are your two alignment marks. And there's a corresponding hole in the uh, the in the card body. So basically, you just line up those two and take your set screw, put that into place. And that will pretty much guarantee your alignment is correct. So once you get the the bowl in and your screw in, you don't want to tighten that up, right? Because the reason the reason being is the float ball screw or whatever you want to call it actually is what drives the ball into the car body. So what will happen is if you tighten this up first, um, the ball can have a tendency to rock on the uh, the, the uh, surface of the, of the car body. So you want to get this just aligned uh, with that screw and then go ahead and put the uh, the valve trap bolt or whatever, or whatever you want to call it in. And what's going to happen is this will actually torque the ball to the body so it's nice and flat. So we did that one. So we're going to go ahead and do the other one. Same process, get the screw in there, get them lined up. We're at the point where the float balls are attached to the body. So when you tighten these up, don't go too tight because if you really tighten them up over than what they really need to be, you can actually crack these balls. Um, so again, tighten them up, snug them up, a little bit past snug. And then once you do that, go ahead and tighten your Little alignment screw, same thing. T tight but not over torqued. That's it. So I know I still need to uh, put um, clamps on these water traps. So don't think I'm forgetting about that. I just need to get a bigger clamp. I just need to go out to the toolbox and find a little hose clamp that's gonna fit over those. And uh, at this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the air screws back in and then get the cards back in the sled. All right, so before I uh, reinstall the carbs, I figured I would take 10 or 15 minutes to pull the rats, uh, the nest out of there. They're definitely not rats. Uh, I'll tell you how we know that in a minute. <laughs> and. Uh, so I wanted to pull all this stuff out of there because I knew it was soaked in gas and uh, there's no sense of having a possible fire with all that stuff soaked in gasoline. So went ahead and uh, I basically been using this little grabber tool to grab everything out and that's what I pulled out of there. That's all fiberglass insulation and as I was going through it, I found the, I found the little bastards uh, one and two. So they didn't make it. I don't know if they drowned in the gasoline or what, but needless to say, these guys will not be uh, living here any longer. All right, so what we're gonna do is, before I put the cars back in there, I'm just gonna inspect the boots and look at the reeds and everything else and make sure we're good to go. And then I'll go ahead and uh, put the uh, the cars back in, reattach the oil lines. And then I'll show you how you you uh, check the uh, the TPS settings on the carb. All right, so at this point, everything is back together. The the seats on, the tanks on, the consoles on, the air boxes in, and <clears throat> everything else. Um, I gotta apologize, guys, because my intent was after putting the carbs in, I was gonna show you how to set the TPS using a device such as this, using a five volt power supply, which is which is something I built based off a YouTube video I found. Unfortunately, uh, I thought I hit the record button when I was setting it, 
and unfortunately it was like a five or six minute process i thought i was all set i thought i hit the record button and then um i went through and put the this everything back together and i was looking at the the footage and actually i never hit the record button so uh, i don't have any of that so what i'm gonna do is um i'm actually gonna link uh, a video to the person that actually shows you how to build that uh five volt tester or if you want, you can actually purchase a tester on your own that's already built. It's actually available on Amazon. I think it's like a hundred bucks. Uh, I think I'm gonna go that route anyway. But it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the biggest issue is having the tester or the power supply. Setting the TPS, it's very easy once you do uh, once you do it and understand the concept. So at this point, the Fusion is all set to go. Uh, we've already done the, the majority of the maintenance on it. Took care of the primary, the secondary, greased it up and everything else. And at this point, it's going to be ready for the next year, next season. As far as uh, upcoming stuff on the channel, I'm going to do a, a product review of this guy right there. Uh, I actually uh, splurged for a new helmet this year, and I'll explain why. Uh, but this is a great helmet, and I'll explain why. It's well worth the money. So make sure you're looking for that. And also... The next project that's going to be coming into the garage, I'll give you a little hint, that guy right there. So, stay tuned. Uh, how, I hope everybody liked the, uh, the video on the flat slides. If there's any questions, comments, concerns, go ahead, go ahead and leave them in the comments box. And I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks for watching and have a, have a great day.